this, this story, and I've made mention of it a few times in the past. Don't know that I've ever preached the entire chapter uh, or the entire story, but I've used it uh, for different things. We use it for talking about false prophets uh, that the Bible talks about and uh, later on makes reference to the Korah, the, that, that type of a false prophet, and uh, different uh, ways in which I've used it before. But recently it came into my mind uh, more specifically uh, let me tell you, uh, kind of got my mind going. I saw this meme online, and here's what it said. You never know where a message is going to come from, right? <laughs> but I saw this meme online that said, uh, okay, it was uh, two people on the workforce or a bunch of people on the workforce, and there was this uh, lady that was walking around with a book. Maybe she's a supervisor or something like that, and these other guys, maybe construction workers or something like that, uh, they said, uh, 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 you know, they're talking to her, and she's like, I've never done your job, but my book says you're doing it wrong, okay? And if you ever worked on a place where you, you've you done the job, you know, your whole life or for many years, whatever, you, you've worked hard, you know how to do it, and then you get some person that comes on the job that doesn't really know how to do the job, but they're supposed to tell you how to do your job, that is very frustrating. <laughs> it's very annoying. Who's ever had that happen? Uh, they come in. Now, I'm going to tell you my experience was that oftentimes in some of the jobs that I did, it was a woman, just like that meme is saying. And the main reason for that, uh, and this is not meant to be controversial or anything like that, but the main reason for that was because that wo the women couldn't do the job that the men were doing because they weren't physically capable to do that job. But they couldn't not hire them because that would be discrimination. So they went ahead and hired them and moved them right up to the top to, <laughs> to supervise over the guys, and it was kind of frustrating because you're like, you don't even know how to do this job. <laughs> you're just sitting there barking out orders, and and anyway, so that got my uh, my mind going a little bit. Uh, Super Bowl is coming up, and I got to thinking about today. You know, is going to be the Super Bowl, and there's going to be thousands upon thousands of men at home in the recliner, telling the quarterback, you know, what he's supposed to be doing. Or telling the referee about the bad call that he made. Or telling the coach, you know, he should put so-and-so in. Or he should take so-and-so out or whatever. And uh, we call those armchair quarterbacks. <laughs> armchair quarterbacks is what I, I've always heard people that would do that. And, and I'm not specifically talking about football today, but I'm talking about uh, people who don't pay attention so much to doing their own job. Whatever it would be in life, where their position that they're in in life or their actual job at work or, or whatever, but they don't pay as much attention to that as they do looking at everybody else and realizing how they're not doing the job the way that they would do it if they were in that position or, or something like that. And, and, and so they're just very critical of that. And that is a basic idea. When I watch these guys and I, and I think about that kind of a guy, I'm thinking, man, you wouldn't last two seconds in a real football guy. I mean, put some pads on that, put him out there in the front line. He's not going to make it, right? Uh, how about boxing? You know, I think about that sometimes. People criticizing a boxing match or something like, hey, this guy should have done this, he should have done that. And I'm thinking, man, put the guy in the ring for two minutes and he's, he's, he's gone, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and this is how, uh, this is how people are though. Normally we, we are pretty good at being critics. And we're all guilty of it from time to time. I know I'm, I'm super uh, uh, guilty at it from time to time. Let me give you a few areas that we see this in life uh, regularly. It seems like many people who have no experience in the medical profession are medical experts. And I'm guilty of that myself. I think I know uh, how something works medically or whatever, and I give everybody instructions. And whenever a doctor says something, I just assume that they're, uh, they're probably wrong. But the fact is, that's not my job. Now, I am responsible for my family, and, and uh, there's a lot of things that I won't put at risk just because a doctor said, hey, do this. You know, uh, I've got my own feelings about that. Uh, but it, the truth be told, I don't have any medical field knowledge. I don't understand that stuff. I can't uh, teach people how to do these things. Politics, I don't know about politics, but sometimes you get in a conversation with the guys, and all of a sudden you're just spouting things out there like uh, you're some expert in what's going on in our world uh, but the fact is I don't know <clears throat> more uh, more probably common parenting advice from people who don't have kids <laughs> right or marriage advice from people who don't they've never been married before and this is the kind of stuff that you get and then another thing is this 
biblical matters, theology, right? Somebody starts preaching or trying to, uh, you know, whatever their field, a pastor or maybe a missionary or whatever, really easy to criticize, talk about how they're doing everything wrong, or somebody gets up and they preach, and it's easy to sit back and listen to a message and criticize all the uh, false things that they said in the message, maybe whether by accident or just slip and weren't thinking about it or whatever. Be really easy to criticize that. So many different ways uh, that we could uh, see that. And the argument is usually, yeah, well, you know, that's their field. That's their field of expertise. I don't know how to do those things because I've never done it, but that's their field, so they should be experts at it. Okay, and if that's the case, if that's the excuse, then you ought to you ought to say this. If then you should be doing as good at your job as you expect them to do at their job, whatever the case may be. All right. So number one, first point I want to make, and I'm using this text as a as a basic. Uh, we're kind of like looking through the text almost expository, I could say. <clears throat> Number one, instead of focusing on their own jobs, talking about arm, armchair quarterbacks, instead of focusing on their own jobs, they get their eyes on someone else's job. Easy to do, super easy to do. You think you could do everybody else's job better than they could. Look at Numbers 4. Numbers 4. One through four, and the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi after their families by the house of their fathers, from thirty years old and upward, even until fifty years old, all that enter into the host to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. And uh, it goes on, talks a little bit about, uh, you know, would they deal with the holy things? And then Aaron uh, and, and his sons, they have a job to come in and basically they cover up those holy things. So the sons of Kohath don't have direct access to them. They're just kind of working around those things. Look at verse 18. Cut ye not off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites, but thus do unto them that they may live and not die when they approach unto the most holy things. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint them every one to his service and to his burden. And so the idea was that God had given Aaron and his sons the specific job of having direct access to these holy things, all the holy instruments and stuff that were uh, to be in the holy place. And then, of course, when they were ready to move, They'd have to be covered up. They'd have to be packed up. And then the, the Kohathites would be responsible for carrying those on the journey wherever they go. All right. And so when we read in, uh, in number 16 about Korah, Korah was a son of Kohath. Uh, uh, he was a Kohathite. Okay. And so uh, this is what we're talking about. This was his responsibility. He did have a job. He had a job. Uh, of dealing with the most holy things and uh, taking care of those. And, you know, you could say, well, why Aaron? Why did God pick Aaron and his sons uh, to have direct access to the holy thing? And this is kind of what happens here in a minute is uh, we, we know that Korah is going to, and those, the party that he raises up there are going to say, hey, we're all holy, right? And uh, so you might say, well, why Aaron? Look, honestly, think about what Aaron did when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments, uh, you would think that that would have been when he allowed the people to have a, a golden calf and all that. You would think that God would have come down real harsh on him, and yet he still got this job, this position, and his family is supposed to do this, uh, uh, this particular thing where they have direct access to the holy things. And the Kohathites, all they're allowed to do is wait until it's all covered up and all that, then they have to carry them to the next place. Okay, But that is still their job. That's what they're supposed to do. And instead of, uh, of just doing their job, it's so easy for them to look at, well, why does Moses get to do that? Why does Aaron and his sons get to do that? And people can begin to talk around the camp, no doubt about it, and, 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 and thinking about that, and begin to kind of covet after that position and that authority and that job. 
And so, uh, and I think this is what happened. You know, we've talked about covetousness in here, covetousness, covetousness in here, and be, and coveting is in and of itself just the action, the verb there isn't necessarily bad. You know, if I'm coveting after, if I'll co- I, I say I covet your prayers, you know, uh, that's not a sin. If I covet, you know, my my wife's attention or something like that, that's not bad. That that's just a word. Coveting, it's not necessarily bad. Just like. It's not bad to be angry. The Bible says be angry and sin not. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that we do. It's an action, but it's not necessarily bad in and of itself. I can go down the list. Uh, jealousy, you know, well, if jealousy is wrong, why is God a jealous God? I mean, there's, there's a time to be jealous, you know, and, uh, and there's a certain word. But why is one of the Ten Commandments, why does it have to do with, uh, with coveting? Well, it makes it very specific. It says not to covet your neighbor's wife, and not to covet your neighbor's ass, and not to covet your neighbor. See, uh, it's specifically wanting what somebody else has and thinking, I'm not content with what God gave me. I want what they have, and going after that and pursuing after that, which is exactly what uh, Korah does here. So instead of focusing on their own job, these arm back, armchair quarterbacks, uh, they get their eyes on someone else's job. Now let's go to number two. Number two is instead of trying to help, to be a help to that person or the people, they want to notice that person's faults. All right, let me say that again. Instead of helping them, they want to notice, they want everybody else to notice that person's faults. So let me explain. Let's go back to the armchair quarterback, all right? So, uh, you know, you're a big Chiefs fan, let's say. Right, you really love the Chiefs. You want them to win. What good is it really? To, uh, this is a bad. That's a bad example. But but since that's the <laughs> the, the illustration for the title, <clears throat> you really want them to win. What does criticizing their quarterback or criticizing their coach or criticizing what does that really do to anybody? Nothing, right? And the same is true. Uh, let's say in the workforce. What good does it really do to criticize your boss or worse yet? start talking to all the other employees and being like, hey, have you noticed that the boss always does this and the boss is like, he doesn't treat us right? You know, you know, what is that really doing to help the organization? What is that doing to help the, the boss? You know, uh, but no, there's this idea and it's tagged along with this idea of the covetousness, this idea of uh, having your eyes on the other person's job instead of focusing on your own job is that all of a sudden you have this desire to bring everybody else along and to get in on that criticism and to, uh, and to start turning against that person. It reminds me of Absalom. You know, Absalom, uh, I don't know how things would have turned out had David done right and, uh, uh, you know, had uh, his sister Tamar not been raped and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know how... But here's what we know. After certain things were done, Absalom despised his dad. And it appears like he just didn't start thinking about his dad doing much better. And the Bible begins to explain how he seems to have this plan of going after his dad's position there. And so 2 Samuel 15, 4 says, Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land that every man which had any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And in verse 6 he says, And on the, this matter, manner, and on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He had this plan to get everybody on his side and be friends with them and impress them and act like, hey, I could do so much better than, uh, than these other people are doing. And this is a big uh, problem that people uh, uh, trap people fall into. All right, so then what happens is then they act like everybody's on their side. Even though oftentimes it's like one or two people or a handful of people or like one family. Well, I've seen this my whole life in ministry. Uh, you know, there's usually one disgruntled uh, member in a church who doesn't like what the pastor's doing or something like that. And they come and they're like, hey, everybody has been talking to me. And everybody's been saying X, Y, Z, right? And really, if you narrowed it down, it's like maybe one person, you know, or maybe it's a man. Really, 
in it <laughs> or something like that. And, and, uh, and really, but he wants it to sound like he's got this huge uh, group of people backing him up. Well, look at that. What Korah did. Start there again in verse 1. And now Korah, the son of Ishar, uh, the son of Kohath, Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of They went and they took men, they, ga they gathered men to themselves. They rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. All right, so he's actually getting these kind of well-respected people, known people in the uh, uh, congregation there, in the, in the camp, and he gathers them up, no doubt talking behind the scene, behind closed doors, discussing about the faults of Moses and Aaron and, and their son, uh, 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 Aaron's children and, and talking about all that. And, uh, and they began to, uh, you know, raise all these accusations. And I'm telling you, there's this uh, certain event that happened to me uh, that pops into my head when I think about this. <clears throat> and I, I really don't like getting into the the drama, uh, kind of new IFB drama, you know, uh, I, I, I kind of keep up with it because I listen to some preaching and I, and I see different things that are shared and I'm part of a certain group and stuff. And sometimes it really annoys me. Other times it piques my attention enough to follow along with the drama, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. But anyway, there's a group of, uh, there's a group of preachers who've kind of split from the original new IFB or something like that. Again, I'm not really into all the drama, so I'm not trying to make any statements or line up with any particular. I'm just an independent fundamental Baptist, okay? Uh, but it's a, it, some of this goes back to a time when Anderson uh, made a documentary going back to the Greek. And if you remember in that documentary, uh, he had worked with a guy who was Reformed Baptist. And so... Uh, they put this out, and he said, hey, I don't have a problem with the guy. Line, line up with him on everything doctrinally, but I believe he's saved. He's King James. He, you know, he, he believes in soul winning the same way I do and everything. And so he, now, I don't know all the details. I don't know all the accusations. I don't know what some people have said about that relationship or why they broke up, off with him. I don't necessarily know all the details on that. But here's what I do know. Somewhere around that time, and it wasn't directly related to this, it was just me studying, during that time I was studying what Baptists have as a uh, kind of confession of faith. You know, uh, 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 what do they have as like a creed? And I was under the impression, independent Baptists particularly, like we don't actually have a creed. They shouldn't like say, hey, if you're going to be an independent Baptist, you have to believe this. Well, that's kind of contrary to what the independent part means about being independent Baptist, right? So we have no kind of like a, a doctrinal state. I mean, we might have a doctrinal statement, but I'm saying it doesn't like it's not part of a of a group or a, a denomination or something like that. But I got to find out that there was something called the Baptist uh, Confessions, or the, some people call it the Baptist Catechism, and uh, and I began studying about that. Now this was back. You know, this was a while back, maybe a couple of years ago. I can't remember how long this whole ordeal was. But uh, did anybody know when he put that documentary out, going back to the Greek, a couple years? I'm going to say two years. I think that's probably right. And anyway, so I put on this on Facebook, not part of that, you know, confusion and drama at all. I just put this on Facebook, just totally separate. I uh, wasn't even thinking about that. And I said, Acts 17 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And then I put this as a tag with that verse. I said, so many Baptists today, quote unquote, are actually Protestant reformers. I said, true Baptists are independent and don't need to look at the Baptist catechism for their Calvinistic reform theology. I really had I made no association with that post to, you know, Pastor Anderson and his relationship uh, with there. And, uh, and it wasn't long after that. I remember I got a lot of comments on there. And then a particular person me private messaged me 
pastor that was kind of in the new IFB at that time. And he messaged me out of the blue and said, oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that. I'm getting so tired of all these ecumenical people and all that stuff. And he's like, there's people that are rising up and, uh, and are noticing this with Pastor Anderson. And I'm just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not wanting to be part of any kind of you know, drama or anything like that. And I kept note in my mind, and I'm like, there's something wrong here. This person is, is talking about another pastor, and he's coming to me, private messaging me, being, hey, I think we're on the same page. And all I'm, I'm just red flags going off in my mind saying, hey, that's like Cora, Cora, Cora. When people are like trying to get gather up a troop of guys and uh and turn them against another pastor or, or group or something like that there's there's a miss there's some missing things you know going on here they should be taking that their problems to that pastor and talking to him about that and i don't know if they did uh to what extent they did or whatever but i had no business being brought in on it and uh but it seemed to me like one of these cora type uh things and sure enough uh, this man started teaming up with some other guys and they ended up, uh, you know, uh, kind of, they're at, at, at warfare right now, <laughs> I guess, against the other guys in the new IFB. Like I said, I try not to get in on all that drama. I, I certainly don't want to be attached to it. That's why I'm not like throwing names out and everything. Uh, but most of you guys probably know the story. Okay. So, uh, how could that have happened? I mean, what if somebody was really genuinely concerned? You know, they really just felt like, hey, there's something going on here. I don't like the way things are going. I need to talk to this pastor. I need to. There's many ways that that could have been dealt with. And I suspect that there were some men that had a problem with that who did maybe did it the right way and quietly left or, or didn't make a big deal. I don't know. Again, I, I, I don't know all the, the details on that, but. Here's the thing that I'm the point that I want to make. The third point is this. Instead of helpful words, they offer only negative criticism. And the second point was instead of trying to help that person, they want others to notice the person's fault too. And then instead of helpful words, they offer only negative criticism. Let's go back to our text and look at verse 3. Number 16, verse 3. <clears throat> And they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? See, all they wanted to say is, hey, you guys put yourself in this position. You think you're holier than everybody else. And you think you're, you, you deserve to be this, in this position. And Moses later on goes on to say, look, I didn't even want this position. If you remember the burning bush, when God's calling him to do this job, and he's like, I don't want this. Call somebody else, right? But God's put him in this place now, and he's trying to follow God. He's trying to do what God wants him to do. And now these guys are rising up saying, hey, you take too much on yourself. Who do you think you are? And, uh, and they're just making all these accusations. Verse 7. Uh, let me see. Yeah, they say it again. Uh, and put fire. Okay, no, no. I was just uh, uh, noticing in, in verse seven how he kind of back and tells uh, and tells them that they take too much uh, upon themselves by rising up against him. But I didn't mean to go there. Look at uh, Exodus eighteen and uh, notice notice what they say. Uh, you take too much upon you, and they're uh, you know they're accusing them of. Uh, of all these things are even going to go on later on to say, uh, you know, hey, you just wanted to be a prince among us. And and uh, you made these grand promises about how you're supposed to. He didn't make them. He just was repeating what God said about how you're going to take us to the promised land. Hey, where's this promised land? You said we're going to have our own land. We're not going to be slaves anymore. We don't have our lands. We're wandering around the wilderness. And they're just attacking uh, Moses and they're giving him grief. And I want to compare that story, and you've probably heard me make this comparison before, but I think it's really important to, to notice this comparison between the way that Korah approached the situation when he thought Moses was taking too much upon himself in the sense that, you know, he thinks highly of himself, and so he's making himself to be a leader. But then there's a story where Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, in Exodus 18, 
uh, comes and he, he's kind of seeing how God's been blessing everything and Moses is showing him around. And start in verse 12 there. It says, His father-in-law took a burnt took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did unto the people, he said, What is this thing that you do to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? When they have a matter, make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses, uh, Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing which thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. He's basically saying, Moses, you're taking too much upon yourself. But you see the different attitude? You got one saying, yeah, you think you are taking too much upon yourself. And they're just like seeking after his position. And they're wanting to get the accolades and everything that he has. Jethro saying, whoa, man, you're going to wear yourself out. You're going to wear these people out. But what you're doing is not good. And then he proceeds to kind of give him some advice and give him an option of what he can do. Hey, how about this? How about we will you take some other men? What does he say? Uh, anybody remember what, where I left off? Uh, okay, hearken now to my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring this cause unto God. Now that's good counsel too. You know, are, have you, have you, are you praying to God about this? Do you, you know, is this what God wants? Hey, if God wants you to do something, that's between you and God, I'll leave you alone. Right. But uh, uh, but if if this is good, if God would bless in this way, then, uh, hey, bring this cause unto him. Right. Verse 20. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shalt show them the way there wherein they must walk and uh, walk uh, in the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth. Look at this. Hating covetousness. And place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. So he's, he's giving them his advice and he's saying, hey, pick some guys that are, are good guys who love the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit. They're, they're not covetous and all this. And, and, uh, and, and they can help you to do this. God can use them. Well, that's kind of what he's wanting to do. Only Korah was wanting to just tear him down so that he could lift himself up. Totally different motivation on how they approached this, and they tried to help uh, Moses and Aaron. So uh, uh, they say there in verse 3, go back to uh, number 16. Number 16, they say in verse 3, Ye take too much upon yourself. All right, we already talked about that. Then they say, all the congregation is holy, right? Seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. So what they're saying is, hey, you think you're holier than us, but look, all of us are holy. Right? <laughs> now, you, you might say, you might find fault with Moses. He's got them. You might find fault with Aaron. He had them. His sons, they had faults, right? And so you would say, like, look, we're holier than he is. We are equipped to serve the Lord, or at least as holy, they should say, we're equipped to serve the Lord. Why is God using him? And the answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> Why did God use them? I don't know, but he chose them for that position, and he chose them to do that job. And so uh, uh, look at verse 13. He says, It is a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and, uh, milk and honey uh, to kill us in the wilderness, a prince over us? Look, it wasn't his fault that they weren't able to go into the land right away. The murmuring and the complaining and the saying, oh, we can't go into land. There's giants in the land and all that. And so they're wandering around the wilderness for 40 years and they're taking it out on Moses and he's just following what God said to do. 
<clears throat> so they're saying, hey, you just want to be a prince over us, and they're accusing him of all these things. They've raised up this group of men uh, to, uh, to gather together because they have power in numbers, and they're going to go basically saying, you know, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to have fields. Uh, uh, what did he, what did he say? Uh, let me see here. Verse, check my notes here. Uh, verse 14. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into the land that floweth with milk and honey and given us the inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. They're just totally protesting, saying, hey, we're not going to get behind you. You're not, you're not giving us what we want. <laughs> you know, you're not giving us uh, uh, all the desires of our heart like we thought you were going to. And the bottom line is, number one, we're going to see that this, it was ridiculous uh, that they even thought that they, you know, God had called them to this or something. I guess they didn't even think about what God's opinion on the matter was. Uh, but the thing is, had they been in charge... They certainly wouldn't have done anything any better, right? And if they were following the commandments of God, they would have saw the hearts of the people and they would have seen that God was, you know, moving in a certain way and they would have either done the exact same thing that Moses and Aaron did or worse, right? But they instead just felt like they uh, could have done such a better job or whatever, neglecting what their own job and their own duty was. That wasn't important to them. They had their eyes on someone else's job. But what we find in, as we continue to read on, where the story gets real exciting, is that they end up being judged before God. They, uh, in fact, they end up being judged before all. And that's my last point, is that these uh, armchair quarterbacks, so to speak, they will be judged, okay? Now, there's a principle in the Bible. Everybody likes talking about uh, don't judge, right? Thou shalt not judge, judge not. But it is in the Bible. Okay, so we're not overlooking it because we get so sick about hearing people use that and they use it out of context or they twist it or they use it to benefit themselves. You know, hey, don't really care about don't care if you judge other people for me. And, uh, and so they talk about that. But look, it is in the Bible. We don't overlook it. Uh, Matthew 7, 1 says, judge not that ye be not judged. And of course, as you read the context there, continue reading in Matthew 7, what you see is that he's saying, look, by the same judgment that ye judge, you're going to be judged by that judgment too. And people tend to forget, like, hey, I don't want people criticizing me and looking at me and judging me and deciding if I'm doing a good job. But yet I will look at them and decide if they're doing a good job and see, you know, and start thinking that I could. And so, uh, so the Bible does say a lot about judging. Look at James chapter 4. And look at uh, verse, I can't read my writing here. It's 11 or 12, I'm not sure. James chapter 4. <clears throat> start with verse, uh, well, let's start with verse 10, even better. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Look, there's a lot of things in this life. Now, there are certain judgments we're required to make when it's our responsibility to make that. And we make those judgments based off God's word. So basically, he is the judge. The Bible, these are his judgments. And so when we judge somebody based on, hey, the Bible says this, don't judge me, I'm not. God judged you, okay? But that's a judgment to be made. But when we go around judging whether or not somebody is called of God or whether or not they should have done this or whether or not, you know, and we start critiquing their ministry and everything, it's finding our own business and doing what God called us to do in the job he's called us to, then we just open it up for all kinds of problems, and we open it up for all kind of judgment upon ourselves. Look at Romans 14. Got to be really careful not to be armchair quarterbacks. Romans 14, verse 10. 
But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. When we stop and realize that, like I'm, I'm responsible for myself. I, I, I'm responsible for my family that God's given me. As a pastor, I'm responsible for the church that I have authority over. I'm responsible for these things. I have no business looking at someone else's pastor, uh, pastoral abilities or leadership and just go around criticizing that and spreading gossip about him and trying to destroy his ministry or something like that. Or another man, the way that he runs his family or whatever. Look, if I think that I could help by talking to that person and saying, hey, can I give you a suggestion and try to help him that way, then great. But if I just gather people around, did you see what he did? That's not benefiting anybody. You know, you're going to give account for yourself. You're not accountable uh, to God for those uh, for that other person's life. So we should focus on that. Korah and his company ended up being judged. All right, back to number 16. Korah and his company of men that he brought with him were judged quite harshly. And this is why I get nervous when I'm around somebody who is overly critical on the way somebody does something because I'm like, man, it's just a matter of time before God is going to I'll put the spotlight in your life on what your responsibilities are and people are going to see your shortcomings. And it's like, it's like you know, by what judgment you judge, then you shall be judged, you know. And so here, here's what we got in uh, number 16. Look at verse 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die uh, uh, the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. Now he's taking, he's really sticking his neck out here. God must have really this, or he just has such confidence that God heard him. And he just flat out said, look, if these guys just die a normal death, then look, they're right and I'm wrong. And then he gets real specific. He says, but if the ground opens up and swallows them, then, then God has called me. Uh, verse 30, but if the Lord make a new thing in the earth, open her mouth and swallow them up with all the appertaining to them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Now, what's interesting is the ground does open up, obviously. Korah and his uh, company, they go down, straight down into the pit alive, it says. I mean, they're just like, they're, they're falling. I mean, obviously, they didn't stay alive, but they're falling. Okay. Uh, and then a lot of other guys are still going to be judged. So it's kind of like in the eyes of all the people. They already saw that. They already know now. Okay. Moses and Aaron are God's men. He's, he wants them, for whatever reason, to do the job that they're doing. Okay, But now God's going to make another point with these 250 men. Look at verse 36. Or actually, we've got to back up a little bit. Let me see here. Uh, verse 34. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Okay, now here's the interesting thing about that. When we read back in Numbers 4 about who's supposed to be actually touching the holy things and offering the incense and doing all those things, it was Aaron's sons. Okay, and Eleazar was one of them. But, you know... After they had challenged Moses, basically, and thought, and basically, it's kind of like saying, you know, they could do a better job almost. Then it's kind of like, okay, you know what? We're going to put you in. We're going to give you a shot at this. <laughs> and I kind of go back to the, the football illustration in my mind. What if some guy, you know, finally gets, you know, he's just criticizing, he's sitting in the game and he's cussing out the ref and he's yelling at the coach and all that kind of stuff. What if they were like, you know what? Put him on the front line. Give this man some shoulder pads and a helmet. Put him on the front line. And let him prove himself. 
what do you think is going to happen after the hut, hut, hike? That guy's going down, <laughs> right? So here's what happened. They, uh, they actually end up being consumed by fire. Why? That was the punishment God said. If you touch the holy thing that I told you not to touch, you're going to be consumed. So they did. And so what does God do? Verse 36, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. The censers of these sinners against uh, their own souls... Let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar, for, uh, for they offer them before the Lord. Before, uh, uh, therefore, they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar the priest took the brazen censers wherewith they had, uh, that they were burnt, had offered, and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar to a memorial of the children of Israel, that no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense uh, before the Lord, that he be not as Korah and as his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. God puts back everything back in its proper place. Business goes back as usual with this great memorial that, hey, you don't want to try to do it your way and supersede God's will and what he wants and the order that he put things in and start thinking, you know what, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to cause some trouble and I'm going to turn people against this guy like Absalom did. How did Absalom end up, by the way? Hanging by his long, pretty hair, <laughs> right? It didn't go so well for him when he thought he was going to go up against God's anointed. Now, did David make some terrible mistakes? Most certainly. I read about him all the time and cringe and think, why is David such a holy man when the Bible tells us about all these wicked things he did? Well, we know because, well, number one, he was humble and he searched the Lord and he, and he repented of his sins after they were called out and he understood uh, that he had done wrong and he felt the guilt of it and had godly sorrow. He repented of them. And God said, I can bless a heart like that. And God continued to use David and blessed him in mighty ways. But all those who went up against him do a better job and they wanted to go against God's anointed, but they ended up being put to the test and they all died miserably. Okay. And so this was the case here. All things kind of go back uh, to normal the way they were supposed to. And Eleazar is told to do what he's supposed to do. And obviously the story continues and there's, a, there's uh, other things that could be said from this chapter. Basically, I think we get the point. We get what wanting to say by this whole idea of armchair uh, quarterbacks. And uh, obviously the application there, because uh, these are spiritual uh, men that God had ordained, and so obviously in my mind I keep thinking about the ministry and trying to make some comparisons there and everything. But look, this is just true. And wherever you are in your life, where God's put you in your life, uh, it doesn't matter if it's your job, you know, your family versus someone else's family, or ministry even. Don't covet somebody else's ministry that for whatever reason God has allowed them to be there. Hey, seek to help them. Seek to uh, 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 encourage them. And uh, you worry about doing the job that God has you at right now and, and, and what he wants you to do. So focus on your own responsibilities. Not some If you do have a problem with the way someone's doing something, don't try to get everyone else involved and point out the fault and try to raise up a... a, a an army or a gang or something. If you are going to make criticism, you have to say something, you know, and it's right to say something sometimes, then be sure it's something that's helpful and offer a solution and make sure God's in on it. And then finally, remember that you will be judged according to your own responsibilities. So the whole time you're judging somebody else, you know, it's just building up for the day when it's going to be time for you to prove your works. And is God going to uh, uh, make sure everybody sees you fail or are you going to uh, have his mercy like, like uh, Aaron and Moses did in spite of all the? Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for this story in the Bible. And it comes up again later on in the New Testament. And, and uh, obviously we know everything is in there for a reason. It's inspired and, and it ser serves uh, to give us a, a lesson and give us something to learn and and uh, I pray that you'll help us to commit this to our minds, keep us humble, keep us focused on our own lives and our own uh, families or ministries or whatever you have uh, uh, in our lives. And, uh, uh, and help us to seek the benefit of the whole 
uh, congregation and, and, and your, uh, your will to be done in our lives. I pray that you help us to do that. I uh, pray that you'll keep uh, apply this in our hearts throughout the week, the way that uh, you would have us to, to think about it. And bless this uh, church, Lord. Bless the work that's being done and souls being saved. I pray you help us to increase laborers. Help us to uh, be able to disciple some of these folks and get them uh, uh, moving and growing in their Christian life. Uh, give us wisdom. Give me wisdom as I try to lead. And I pray you be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.